Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Lebo with the Maryland State Health Department Center for STI Prevention. Prevention. And um, on behalf of our webinar hosts, the Mid-Atlantic Regional Public Health Training Center here at Johns Hopkins, and our other training partners, the STD HIV Prevention Training Center at Johns Hopkins, and MedCHI, our Maryland State Medical Society, we'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Developments in STI Testing and Implications for Practice. Today's webcast is live, so during the course of the presentation, feel free to email any questions you'd like to have sent to our speaker by sending them to MAPHTC, that's Maryland Mid-Atlantic, I'm sorry, Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center, M-A-P-H-T-C at J-H-U dot E-D-U. That email will addre address will also appear during the course of the slides uh, at the beginning and at the end to remind you of the address. This webcast is being recorded. It will be archived and up for viewing within the next week or two uh, along with the slides. I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Ann Rampalo, who is a professor of medicine here at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Rampalo is um, in the Division of Infectious Diseases and holds joint appointments in the Departments of Gynecology and Obstetrics, Epidemiology, International Health, and Population Family Planning, sorry, Population Family and Reproductive Health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She's a noted provider in the field of infectious diseases and is an internationally recognized expert in the field of STIs. For over 25 years, Dr. Rampalo has been the medical director of the regional STD HIV Prevention Training Center, one of today's co-sponsors, and she's also our medical consultant at the Center for STI Prevention at the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Thank you, Dr. Rampalo. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. All right. So I am going to move these slides. And we'll begin. This is the webinar. Uh, you can see that the email address is here. Um, and we will try to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. I have nothing to disclose and no conflicts of interest. And I want to thank Dr. Gatos, Charlotte Gatos, who's over in the School of Medicine and a, uh, an expert on point of care testing for sharing some of her slides with me. So what we're going to talk about, and hopefully at the end of this, this talk, you'll be able to discuss the current options available for point of care testing for STIs and HIV, and talk about the pros and cons of the new syphilis rapid test and the reverse syphilis testing algorithm. And then I want to also touch on and have you be able to discuss the importance of extragenital STI testing. So I'm gonna start out with a case. And I made up this case, but she's, she's uh, the two people that I'm talking about is a compilation of many cases we've seen over the years. And I'm going to call her Alyssa, and she's a 17-year-old woman who's a runaway. And she presents, we'll say to you, complaining of five days of vaginal discharge that she says smells funny, is itchy, but she hasn't noticed any blood. She also has mild abdominal pain, mostly during sex. She's been on the street for six months, and she lives with her new boyfriend, Derek. She says she's never had an STI. She's only had sex with Derek, but she engages in oral, vaginal, and receptive anal sex. She's not using birth control, and her last menstrual period was maybe about six, eight weeks ago, she thinks. She says she's only engaged in injection drug use once, and she shared her boyfriend's needles. So even before you examine her, you're thinking as you walk in the door, what's the differential diagnosis for funny vaginal discharge? And of course, chlamydia, gonorrhea, bacterial vaginosis, trichomoniasis, candidiasis, and of course, PID because of the abdominal pain. A big list. You're also considering sites of infection. Does she have HIV? Is she pregnant? What is going on with this drug use? Why is she on the street? Has she been abused? Is there psychiatric issues? And then, of course, what about this partner, Derek? A lot of things to consider. So also remember, she's 17. The anatomy, physiology, and the microbiome of the vagina are indeed age-dependent, just something to keep in the back of your mind. And as you're approaching a neonate or an infant or a prepubescent girl, 
your your thoughts going into the room were different than if it's a pre-menopausal or post-menopausal women. So we're going to talk about first the two types of cervicitis, endocervicitis and ectocervicitis. Endocervicitis, of infection of the, of the columnar cells of the cervix, can be gonorrhea, chlamydia, mycoplasma, genitalia, and indeed herpes. And the ectocervix can be attacked by trichomonas vaginalis and, of course, herpes too. If you just go by symptoms and symptoms alone, it's pretty dismal. And you can see on this slide uh, that, you know, the correlation between, let's say, um, I think I can do this one. No, yes, you can. The correlation can be as, as low as 12% for trick, maybe 62% for odor for BV, but everything is pretty dismal here. So just going by symptoms is not good enough to get you to the diagnosis. So the questions that we're gonna talk about today is what do I have available to me right now that can help me get there? What laboratory tests do I need to order? And what specimens do I need to collect? So we talked about this as near patient or point of care tests for the workup of discharge. And I'm gonna talk about what we have now. So of course you can look at it. You can test the pH. You can add KOH and look for the fishy odor, the amine odor, that's the amine test. And remember the pH, normal vaginal pH is less than 4.5. You look at it under the microscope and look for clue cells. And this is what you see when you examine Alyssa, the cervical discharge, again, you look at it. You can gram stain it if you have that ability in your clinic. Uh, CLIA, so you have to have a CLIA um, you know, certified clinic, and you look for polys. And of course, just the plain swab from the endocervical uh, area, and if you see pus, then it looks like pus. It probably is. So I'm gonna talk about the, um, I guess, the right side of the slide here, and we're gonna talk about what's available to me beyond what we talked about for diagnosis. And uh, gonorrhea culture is always there, Graham saying we talked about. The old diagnostics for chlamydia included a direct fluorescent antibody stain in tissue cultures, which no one does anymore. And now what we do is we have nucleic acid amplification tests, which are the tests of choice. And you can see there's a long line of, of different types of nucleic acid or NATS tests. They're all very sensitive and specific. So how do you get to this diagnosis of gonorrhea and chlamydia? All right. Um, what, are there any point of care tests available to me besides the ones we talked about right now? Okay, yes. These, this is a slide, it's pretty busy, but it tries to um, talk about the sensitivity and specificity of the point of care or a near patient test for gonorrhea and chlamydia. And you can see that there's some cervical, the, the, the sample types are cervical and male urine for the most part, vaginal here. And you can see we have Biostar, Clearview, QuickView, the chlamydia rapid test. And all of these are, oh, maybe from you know, 30 to, at the best, 74% sensitive, good specificity. What we, well, and the same thing uh, is, is for gonorrhea if you look down below. The test that's the best right now is the gene expert test for gonorrhea chlamydia. It is a NATS test. It's considered a near patient test, not a point of care, but near patient. And you can see that it's sen highly sensitive and specific, whether it's vaginal, cervical, female urine, male urine. The, and I'm gonna show you these tests in a minute, but it takes 90 minutes to run this test. It's very sensitive, has great specificity. Now these are the tests that I was talking about, and I pulled these data from the web. This is how much it costs on the web. This is what that Biostar kit looks like. It takes about 20 minutes, $30. The quick view, and you can see there's a lot of steps here. These are, these are theoretical point of care tests, and there's a lot of things you have to add. 12 minutes, fifth, about $16. The chlamydia rapid test is a lot of time-dependent steps here, you can see, as you go along, and that's about $30. So, again, the current reality is that the best test that you could possibly run is the gene expert, which takes about 90 minutes, 
and it has excellent sensitivity and specificity regardless of the uh, type of specimen. Now, how much is this test? This is what it looks like. You can get a, a machine that's probably, oh, I don't know, it, it can sit on a back lab. It doesn't take up that much space. This runs eight cartridges. The uh, cartridges are shown here. And actually, you can see that there are CPT codes and uh, Medicare National Limitation amounts listed here. But how much does this cost? Well, the Gene Expert cartridges for gonorrhea and chlamydia, which includes the um, control about $25, but the machine right now is very expensive. And I pulled this up a year ago. It might be down lower, um, but what you have to do is buy the machine. That's what your upfront cost is. And then you can see. So, I mean, if, you're, if you see a lot of patients, if you uh, are doing this routinely, it may be a good investment. I will say that the same machine that runs the, um, the point of care test for mycoplasma tuberculosis um, is, is, can be used for this too. Same machine. All right, so review NATS are the only tests that are recommended actually by the CDC for gonorrhea and chlamydia. This came out in 2014. Here's a clip of the MMWR that, that recommends it. And I will say, if pin your attention to the bottom of this slide, you can see that NATS are, are cleared, FDA cleared for all of these things, even liquid PAP medium. But the CDC recommends that vaginal swabs as the preferred sample type for females and urine for males. So actually a woman can do her own self-collected vaginal swab and you can send it off if she doesn't want to have an examination. And that's just as good. So let's talk a little bit about what's available right now for the workup of vaginitis. And for bacterial vaginosis, we, we, we look at the clinical AMCELS criteria discharge that you see, pH um, greater than 4.5, uh, the presence of um, clue cells, uh, and amine odor. Nugent's criteria is a gram stain of the vaginal discharge, and you have to do that in the lab. You look at, for candida with a KOH preparation, you could send culture, but it's not available immediately. And of course, trichomonas, we try to look at the vaginal secretions under wet preparation with a light microscopy, but you could do culture. And what we do have for point of care test is the awesome test and the affirm test, which I'm going to talk about. There is a nucleic acid amplification test that just got FDA cleared for females. Uh, I believe it's vaginal swabs, and um, that's available now too, but it is expensive. So here are tables that go over the technique, the time, the specimen sensitivity, specificity, and I will say that wet mount, you, it can be read in minutes, but it's only maybe 50 to 65, 70% sensitive. So we're gonna miss half to 30% of these infections. Culture's great, but you have to wait days. And this awesome test I'm going to talk about, the sensitivity is not that bad, 82 to 95%, and it takes 10 minutes. So let's talk about that. There's other tests that, I that are listed here for your review. These are the nucleic acid amplification tests, um, and they take hours, but uh, it's up to you. They're expensive right now. Hopefully, they'll come down in price, and we'll be using it much more uh, frequently. So these are the tests, and here's the sensitivity. And of course, you, as you would expect, the NATS tests are brilliant. Um, and as you compare the wet mount culture antigen awesome test and the Aptima, you, <laughs> you increase your ability to pick up trichomonas at each test. And this is the point of care test, which is not so bad. Obviously, this is uh, the nucleic acid amplification test, which is great. Now, here's, this is an interesting slide because this says all these tests are great, but how many public health laboratories actually have them? And look at the blue bars, because the blue bars say of 60 public health laboratories that were surveyed in 2010, most of them did not have these tests, and the tests are on the bottom. Xenostrip, PCR, et cetera, even wet mount. So we don't have the availability to diagnose trichomonas very well. All right. All right, and this is the awesome test. It's actually very simple. It's, it's, it's shown here in cartoon. You put a couple drops of the magic elixir in the tube, 
take a swab from the woman's vaginal secretion. Uh, you just make sure that it's mixed well and you get the secretions off the swab and you add the strip. It's an immunochromatographic detection looking for trichomonas vaginalis membrane proteins. It's mouse antibodies. It's capillary action. And the bottom line is if it's a blue line that shows up with a positive red control, she has trichomonas. Now, this, this, these studies were done in, in actually Cincinnati Adolescent Medicine Clinic where girls did their own trichomonas test while waiting and compared it to the results that the clinicians got and it was exactly the same. So this is an easy test to do, and it has pretty good sensitivity specificity. And there it is up close. So back to Alyssa. So you examine her, and you noted the homogeneous vaginal discharge and mucopurulent cervical discharge. And when you did the bimanual examination, she did have adnexal tenderness. And we had a gram stain at our clinic, and we did it. And sure enough, there were gram-negative intracellular diplococci, which are consistent with gonococcal infection. Otherwise, normal. Her urine pregnancy test, which is a stat test that you can do right there, actually you can do it at home, is positive. When we looked at her wet preparation from the vaginal secretions, we saw trichomonads, and her vaginal pH is 6.0, so high. So, didn't Alyssa say she had pharyngeal and receptive anal intercourse? I'm like, what am I going to do about this? You, you can say to me, well, I'm already doing cervical testing on Alyssa. How important is doing an extragenital test anyway? And what do I do about testing these sites? And what tests do I order, and how can I bill for them? So these are good questions. I will refer to two studies, Laura Bachman in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology in 2010. They did a three-year study where they did rectal test sets from uh, individuals who came into the STD clinic and an HIV clinic who gave a history of anal intercourse. This is among the men or were women at risk for gonorrhea or chlamydia. And this is the important thing. Over 60% of gonococcal and 80% of chlamydial infections in MSM would have been missed if you only did a urine and over 20% of chlamydia infections in women would have been missed if you only sent off that swab. Okay, this is another study, obviously much bigger. There's like 22,000 people. It's uh, reported in CID in 2014. And what I want to bring your attention to is the light gray, the light gray bars. And this is the percentage of, of, of infections that you would have missed if you had um, only done a urine. So this is the percentage of gonorrhea and chlamydia infections that would be missed if you only sent off a urine. And for positive pharyngeal gonorrhea, 73% would have been missed. Gonorrhea of the rectum only did a urine. 71% of the infections would have been missed. 92% of the pharyngeal chlamydia infections and 88%. So ask the questions where they have sex and screen and do the nucleic acid amplification test. Now, are, they, are these NATS tests point of care tests? No, but they are available. They're not FDA cleared, but some laboratories have met the clear requirements and established performance specifications for NATS for rectal and oropharyngeal swabs. And that would be LabCorp and, um, help me out, Quest. And they, they're cleared, so they can do it. Many, many laboratories are already cleared. I will say the state is not cleared for the throat, but is cleared, the state laboratory, for rectal swabs. Okay. This is the... Um, Billing codes, you can see them. Pull this back up if you need them. We're not going to spend time saying them, but you can you know, refer to this slide if you need these. So what happened with the test that you sent? Well, Alyssa, gonorrhea NATS positive from her cervix, from her throat, and from her rectum. Chlamydia was positive from her cervix. We did a serologic test for syphilis. We didn't do a rapid test. It's sent off, so right now it's pending. We did do a rapid test for HIV. It's pending and hepatitis C is pending. 
All right, but in the meantime, Derek comes in, her partner, he's 19 year old, he's homeless, and he presented as a contact to, to PID. He has no symptoms, none at all, okay? So you know he's a contact to gonorrhea because she had that. You know he's a contact to trichomonas because she had that. Um, so he says that he practices what he calls survival sex. He has sex when he needs money. He's had over 20 partners, both male and female, over the past six months, and one regular partner, which is Alyssa. He has unprotected oral, receptive, and insertive anal and vaginal insertive sex. He injects heroin when he says when he has enough money, but he doesn't consider himself addicted. And he has had multiple STDs in the past, but he said his last HIV test, which was nine months ago, was negative. And this is what he has on examination. Now let me remind you, this is a plantar palmar rash with mucus patches and condylomata lata around the rectum, all consistent with secondary syphilis. So, in the clinic, he had a rapid plasma reagent test that was positive. And they did, which I'm going to talk about, a rapid syphilis test, which was also positive. He had a determined rapid HIV-1-2 antigen antibody test, which was positive for both antigen and antibody. And I'm going to talk about that right now, too. So let's talk about his other test results that was sent out and came back. Urine, positive gonorrhea. Pharyngeal, positive gonorrhea. Rectal, positive gonorrhea. And chlamydia. So you would have missed it if you had only sent out that chlamydia, a urine. His serologic test for syphilis, which was done in the, the old traditional way, his RPR was 1 to 512, and his FTA was positive. His CD4 count is 250, viral load greater than a million, hepatitis screen AB negative, but he is positive for hepatitis C, and has HCV RNA. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about syphilis. Right now... You can either be doing the old um, non-treponemal screening test, which is an RPR, I'll talk about this, or a VDRL with a confirmatory FTA, or the new reverse algorithm test. Uh, we have new point-of-care serology that is actually a treponemal test. And these serologies are very important um, in, in the WHO syphilis elimination projects especially in mother-to-child transmission of syphilis in their attempts to eradicate congenital syphilis. All right, so traditionally, we do two tests. A non-treponemal, as I said, RPR, or venereal disease research laboratory test. And if it's positive, we used to confirm it with a more specific test. So the screening test is sensitive but not specific, and then we go on. So it's like dip-sticking the urine for glucose, and then if it's positive, then you go ahead to the blood. Um, both tests are imperfect, both in, quite frankly, in sensitivity and specificity. There are biologic false positives. Falsely reactive treponemal tests can be due to cross-reacting serum antibodies. And here's the kicker, and this drives people crazy. A reactive, let's say, FTA or TPPA won't distinguish whether the person is newly infected or has been infected for a long time or has been infected and adequately treated, and you have to just work through it, and that's where we're stuck. So here's serologic reactivity in a syphilis patient. And, you know, this is the infamous, I, I, the infamous contact where the person was inoculated. You know, it takes time before you start to, for your body to catch up that you're infected. So this is the IgM antibodies that come up first, and they will fall. And you will have um, a lag time here. We think that the FTA comes positive first, and, and traditionally we think that the FTA remains positive, whether they're treated or not. All right. Same thing with the TPPA, T8, TPHA, EIAs, whatever is there that we're doing now. The thing is about the VDRL. Your VDRL or RPR starts to rise. Now, remember, this is weeks after infection. So if you're in the secondary stage, you should have a lot of antigens. You should be able to pick antibody antigen reaction. You should be able to pick this up nicely. They peak. But as syphilis is not always, you know, it goes into a latent phase and it goes into latency, a lot of these titers drop naturally. 
What we do is, after we shoot somebody up with penicillin or treat them with doxycycline, according to the stage, we monitor a drop in the VDRL RPR titer, either one, whatever you're doing. And you can see, boom, if you're treated appropriately, it should go down, and traditionally we say fourfold. So if we shoot Derek up with penicillin, he has 1 to 512, he should go down two times, is uh, 1 to 256, two times again, 1 to 128 by six months, and then slowly go down. And your best friend with this is your health department. So if you have titers, you should call your health department because by law they keep records, and you can say, Derek is in, I'm getting ready to treat him, what was his last VDRL or RPR titer? And they'll tell you, and they'll say, oh yeah, he had it before, it was 1 to 4, now he's up to 1 to 512. And you can start again. But they're your best friends with this. And, and no, make sure you know the number, and you call them and let them know. Okay, so here's the thing. We have a second-generation treponemal test. What does that mean? The test that I've been talking about, the RPR and the TPP, or the FTA, it takes one tech, and they have to spend time looking at the test, the VRL titrating, and then doing a specific FTA. One tech, one test. And it takes a lot of time to do this. So what happened is we have a new automated card test that goes through a machine that can run 100 specimens, 100 serologic tests at a go. Much better, particularly if you're screening this in like for blood donations, et cetera. So this is much better. These are recombinant treponema palatum antigens. They were developed in the 1980s, and now we have these new enzyme immune assays or chemolumin assays. Uh, that are available, and let me show you how this goes. So, on the um, right side of the slide, you'll see the traditional test. So you do an RPR, and it's one to one, one to two. You have to quantitate it out. All right. If it's positive, then you go on to your VD. Oh no, no, TPPA or FTA. If it's positive, the person has syphilis, and it's up to us, the clinician or whoever's there, to figure out: is it past? Is it old? Is it past that's been infected or is it brand new? And we have to work that through, talking to the patient, calling up the health department, figuring out what's going on. Well, now this is the new one, which is more cost effective for the laboratory. They'll run the EIA or the CIA first, that card test, off it goes. If it's negative, stops, everything stops. If it's positive, then they'll do the RPR. So it's putting, what we would think old timers like us would think, it's putting the cart before the horse. Okay, positive. Quantitative RPR. If that's positive, you're back. Same thing. Figure out exactly what's going on. Past, present, old, new, treated, whatever. It's you, you figure that. Now, EIA positive, RPR negative. Uh-oh. you got to break the tie. You have to do a TPPA. You have to do a second treponemal test. If that's positive, then you go ahead and you figure out again. Is it past infection? Is it new infection? Where they treat it? You have to go through the same sort of thought process. If it's negative, then syphilis is highly unlikely. Now, if you think this person is just, come, just in that early phase of becoming RPR positive, then you should really evaluate their risk and have them come back in again to get retested with the RPR, because they might be in that, you know, in that window. Okay, now, here's the problem. You know, that, that's a really nice algorithm, but if you're an obstetric, obstetrician, you are not happy with this, because you don't want anybody to have any positive syphilis serologies, period. So this is a study that was just published in CID, Clinical Infectious Disease, from Kaiser Permanente in Northern California. And they've been doing these uh, reverse algorithm on pregnant women for uh, the past three years. And I can tell you they screened about, oh, about 15,000, 11 to 15,000 pregnant women. Um, and in this report, all pregnant women with discordant treponemal serology that is, they had an EIA, CIA positive, and a negative RPR went on reflexively, which is what you're supposed to do to the TPPA. There are 194 women. 
as I said, 38 were CIA positive, RPR negative, TPPA positive. 156 or 80% were CIA positive, RPR negative, TPPA negative. Of those, 77 were retested. And actually, half of the women, pregnant women who were retested, lost the CIA positivity. And they were more likely to be older, have a history of STDs, or actually had been treated in the past for syphilis adequately. There were 189, uh, 194 live births, and actually they were fine. There was no difference in birth outcomes according to the TPPA status, and there were absolutely no stillbirths. So the conclusion was routine retesting of pregnant women with CIA positive, RPR negative, TPPA negative serology, and reflex testing of CIA positive RPR negative specimens with that second, you know, TPPA is very useful given the high likelihood of false positive CIA results in pregnancy. So, again, use your common sense, you can repeat it, but if you're CIA positive, RPR negative, TPPA negative, that does not mean they need treatment. It could be a false positive CIA, and that's what this study pointed to. So, um, sensitivity and specificity for point-of-care diagnostics for syphilis. There have been a lot of point-of-care diagnostics for syphilis, and all of them have been pretty dismal, except the new Trinity Syphilis Health Check, which is called the Rapid Syphilis Test. In, in December of 2014, it was blessed, by the FDA as CLIA waived, okay, and they suggested it should be distributed to non-traditional laboratory sites, including physicians' offices, emergency rooms, maternity ward, wards, and other health facilities, which, you know, I'm not quite sure what that means, health department clinics, outreach sites, community-based organizations, and other freestanding counseling and testing sites. So anywhere that you wouldn't have the, the uh, the VDRL or RPR rapid, it's not, a, it's a rapid plasma reagent test or you wouldn't have the laboratory available right there, you could consider using this. Now, this is what it looks like. It uh, detects both IgG and IgM of treponema pallidum. It takes 10 minutes. There's two steps. You have to use finger stick blood. You can store it at room temperature. As I said, it's cleared. And they're 98% agreement with the reference treponemal assays and 100% agreement in the studies that they did uh, of clinically diagnosed samples. Okay, you read within 10 to 15 minutes, but here's the catch. You have a window. So you've got 10 to 15 minutes. So you can't walk away for 20 or 30 minutes to get sidetracked and come back and read it. You've got to watch. You've got to set your beeper to go and look at that window because otherwise you can't read it. Okay, this is what it looks like. Really nice, really simple. Put the blood in, add the magic elixir, and this is the control has to be always positive, and then this is if, it's, if, it's, uh, if there's uh, treponemal antibodies present. Okay, these are the costs. They're going to vacillate from site to site, whether you can get good prices or not. Um, and do not use this test in someone who has a past history of known syphilis, whether they're treated or not. Because you know what? You're going to pick it up positive anyway. It's not going to help you. But if you're screening someone and they never had a history of syphilis, it will help you. Okay. Oh, now this is, so 20 tests, you buy it in a package, two, $400 in the whole, like, you know, package or $20 a test. You have to have a control. You always have to do controls when you're doing this. And here's all the CPT codes. And I apologize, I went through this quickly. Now that price may change depending on whether you can negotiate to get it lower or your public health lab or whatever. So again, it's all up. This is when I last looked at it. So hopefully it'll be cheaper. Now what about HIV? HIV, the evolution of HIV test. We, you know, everything goes through generations. We had a first generation, now we're at the fourth. Just to review, the first generation went for whole viral lysate. It went for the whole virus, and it detected IgG antibody. 
we got better in that we started in the second generation detecting synthetic peptides and again IgG. By the third generation, we're able to, de to detect IgM and IgG antibody, and now we detect IgM, IgG antibodies, and P24 antigens, and I'm going to show you what this looks like. Combi tests detect both HIV-1 and HIV-2 antibodies. Combo tests uh, look for syphilis and HIV. I mean, I know that that's, that's a fine distinction, but um, yeah, that, sometimes we talk about that. And there are nucleic acid tests that detect HIV RNA, and they're brilliant. Now, this is clipped uh, from a slide presentation by Dr. Bernie, help me out, uh, Branson. Branson, Branson, yeah, at the CDC. I just blocked Bernie. I'm so sorry if you're listening. Um, and this is uh, the, how, um, how the, the uh, different antibodies, the P24 antigens, come up. So you have, obviously, exposure. If you're infected, you'll get a rise in your HIV RNA. You'll have a rise then after that of the P24. You'll have IgG come up, which falls a bit. No, I lied to you. IgM come up falls a bit, and then IgG takes over. Okay? Now, again, this is trying to show you how, what, when a first-generation test would pick up infection, which would be, here's when the inoculation occurred, and we're talking, you know, almost two months, right? Um, between, like, a six weeks and two months, you'd be able to detect it on the first-generation test. But as the generation test got better, they got better at picking up HIV earlier. And the brilliance about the fourth generation test is it is picking up P24 antigen early. And that's what we want because remember, you want to catch people early in the infection so they don't transmit and we can get them on antiretroviral therapy as quickly as possible. So these tests are, I'm very excited about. Here's the commonly used CLIA waived point of care test. These are mostly second generation. There's all sorts of, you know, oral and finger stick, and, I, and you know, we're not going to spend time talking about each one. Uh, they've been around for a while. This, you know, just to show you sensitivity, this is the oral quick. This is what it looks like. It's oral fluid, 99%. This is the, I think this is the reveal, rapid, again, 99%. This is the clear view, 97%. This is the chembio, and then finally the insti. So I, no matter what they are, what they look like, they have great um, sensitivity and specificity. This is the dual path platform HIV-1 and 2. It's clear moderate complexity for serum plasma, or oral fluid, but the nice part about it is it has this what's called a sample tainer. So you put the sample in here, oh no, I'm sorry, here, and you can retain some specimen after testing, and I guess if you wanted to do another test on it, you could. It's very good sensitivity and specificity. And this is the one that is FDA cleared, the Allure, Allure Determine HIV-1 and 2 antigen antibody fourth generation test, the only one that's been blessed so far by the FDA. And the steps are shown here. It's a great test. It's pretty easy to read. Uh, and the brilliance is that it's both antigen and antibody. So, you know, Derek, let me come back for a second. Uh-oh. Derek. Derek is probably, he's antigen and antibody positive. He's early on in his infection. Okay, so we also have to think, remember, about Alyssa. Check her blood tests. Maybe do, you know, a fourth generation. And if she's negative, maybe we want to think about PrEP. Hard. She's pregnant. We want to think about it. These are the third generation, fourth generation tests that are in the lab. <clears throat> They're brilliant. They really... Honestly, they run in an hour. You can get them stat. They're great tests, but just so you know. And this is the sequence of test positivity when you compare it to the Western blot. 
and this is the aptima. This is days before Western blot positive, and as we get to the aptima and the determinant, we're picking them up earlier and earlier and earlier, which is wonderful. And I just wanted to show you that so you'd have another representation of what it looks like. So here's the CDC, um, the American, uh, help me, APHL, Public Health Laboratories. And their APHL proposed new HIV testing algorithm. So, fourth generation, the HIV 1 and 2 immunoassay, which for right now is the determined. If it's negative, then okay, excellent. If it's positive, you want to look and see HIV 1, H positive, HIV 2, negative, okay, obviously, HIV 1 antibodies detected. Here, two detected, both. If it's indeterminate, then you would send a nucleic acid test for um, HIV. Usually it's one, but we'll, you know, it says HIV two negative, HIV one indeterminate. Because in the United States, HIV one is the predominant um, type of HIV. So this is what's proposed. It was updated in June of 2014, and that's how we stand right now. All right, I do believe I finished early, so if we have questions, we can attack them. Anybody here? We had questions about how much it costs, so we got that. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. Um, the reverse algorithm for syphilis came about because it was more cost effective to run 100 samples instead of doing one at a time. Because otherwise could you'd you have to do that? one tech, one test, one tech, one test. Oh, because you can run both at the same time with the reverse. You can run 100 sera in that machine in like the same time. And that's why they did it. It was just time saving. Anybody in the web world? We did have one question um, from um, a clinician in Maryland um, asking about um, reimbursement from insurance companies for point of care tests. Um, and uh, the response from one of our, our national uh, technical advisors on this said that um, you should ask your insurers with whom you have contracts to see if you can expand your contracts to include some of the point of care tests that you do. And that's straight from the state, right? Right. Are there any other questions here? Any parting thoughts? To I do. Follow? Wait, yes. Well, we're running up, I will say to everyone listening, and I'll wait for the question in a minute, but there are new, new point of care tests for STDs, for bacterial vaginosis that are being developed, and they're very exciting, they're fast, they're accurate, and we're trying to get them as cheap as possible. So I didn't talk about them today because they're not FDA blessed and they're not quite ready for prime time. But I will tell you they're coming and they're very exciting, particularly for gonorrhea and chlamydia, and particularly to try to help clinicians decide if the gonorrhea is sensitive to ciprofloxacin. Oh. So stay tuned, because at this time, yeah, that would be great. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Um, you, you briefly um, touched on the combo tests with syphilis and HIV, which I think would be extremely uh, helpful for MSM, uh, maybe home testing. Could you talk a little bit more about where we are with that combo test and its dissemination? Yes, I do believe that Dr. Gatos is doing um, the, she's involved in like the final FDA studies to try to get it blessed. Um, but we did actually, for anyone that's interested too, we do point of care, hands-on training, like a one-day training, and we had 
the company come that, that has the combo test and demonstrate the test for clinician and laboratory and direct feedback, which was really important. So if anybody's interested, stay tuned because you want to come and do that. You want to do the test yourself and maybe get some, um, some access to the new tests that are coming in and really get in there and tell them it works or it doesn't. This is too many steps. I can't read this line. That's important before you have to buy the test. So I invite you all to stay tuned. If you want to come, come. But yeah, it's close, but not quite there yet. I know they're using it. I mean, Dr. Taha, one of our one of our um, one of our researchers were here. I know they're using it in Africa, which is brilliant. But we just don't have the blessing to use it yet. Okay. All right, guys. Everybody's hungry, and they went <laughs> off to lunch. All right. Well, thank you for thank joining you. us for our annual webinar. Thank you, thank all you, Dr. Thank you for coming. <laughs>